Hi everyone, welcome back to the Imperfect Podcast. I'm Kirsten Pfeiffer and I am here today with the beautiful Mariana de la Garza. (laughs) Mariana is an incredible woman who is a new mom actually and is also just taking over the world. She (laughs) is just got her doctors in education. She has her EDD, which I'll let her explain that in a minute. And she's really um, started to uncover this topic of imposter syndrome. And so that's what she's doing grounded theory research in now. So, and she also just started an Instagram community called Dr. Ama, where it goes into the science of imposter syndrome and how we let these narratives run our lives. And so I'm really excited to dive into this topic with her today. So welcome, Mariana. Thank you so much. I I actually... I'm so grateful to be here. I'm so grateful that you're here. Um, So I know that I would butcher what your (laughs) degree is if I tried to say it myself. So can you just explain to everyone what an EDD is and what you do? Yeah, yeah, of course. So uh, there is two ways of getting a doctorate. And one of those ways is to get a PhD, which is traditional. You Mm -hmm. go to school and you learn something about a specific topic and Mm. then you develop a theory okay and then you test your theory and if your theory is correct then great yeah um then you develop something new but uh if you want to go and develop solutions for current practice okay then you would go and get an edd okay which is what you have yes so it's a doctorate of educational leadership okay and my concentration was in doc in um, educational psychology Okay, amazing. And this comparison that you gave me, I feel like might help people that are listening. It's similar to what Brene Brown is doing, correct? Yes. So okay. Brene Brown is a PhD. She okay. does um, do research, but the approach that she takes is called grounded theory, where instead of starting with a theory, okay, you actually let the data tell you about what is happening. Okay. Um, uh, is there a phenomenon happening within, you know, the constraints of what you're researching? Yeah. And then if there is, then you can then compare it to the literature. Okay. But you don't start with the literature. Right, right. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. And so that also makes sense of your journey of how you became passionate about uncovering and diving into imposter syndrome. I know that you said that you noticed these trends with your students because Mariana was also a college counselor for five years, did you say? Yeah, I, that's what I do right now. Okay, and that's what you're still doing. So what were trends you noticed that and how did imposter syndrome show up in your own life and kind of how did you get on this journey to doing what you're doing. Yeah, so I'm going to just backtrack for just mm-hmm. one second because yeah. I, I think it's really important. Language is really important when we talk about these topics. Yeah. And so the way that I define mm-hmm. imposter um, syndrome is it's really the imposter phenomenon of feeling in whatever context that mm-hmm. you are not, that you don't belong mm. and that you're a fraud mm. if you have reached some type of success. Mm. And so when I talk to students, because I am a community college counselor here at Santa Monica College, okay. and I have, um, I've have i done other community colleges in different um, areas around Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. And what I have found is that the typical community college student mm. is between high school student and someone who's re-entering the workforce at like 50 or okay. 30. Okay. Right? And so what ends up happening with some of the conversations with my students is, oh, well, I couldn't possibly do mm. that. Mm. Or I'm not good at math. Mm. Why would I try to go for this major? That right. requires a lot of math. Right. Or um, no, that's not for me because there's no one that looks like me or has acted like me mm. um, or the background that I come from doesn't fit mm. in a neat box yeah. with all the other people that in my head I imagine. Yeah exists in that space yeah and so um when i'm i particularly teach um self-efficacy courses okay uh i teach uh, job readiness courses okay. right when i've taught and so self-efficacy refers to the confidence in your task oriented performance okay that's different than self-confidence. Yeah. You can be someone that's like, I'm amazing. I love myself and have a lot of self-esteem and self-confidence. Right. But sometimes because of the messages that lead us to believe things from the outside in mm. about ourselves, mm. we may think 
I may be good at that task, mm. but I'm not as good as mm. X, Y, and Z. Right. Which may lead to feeling self-imposter. Right. So that's like the difference between self-confidence and self-efficacy. I feel like yeah. confidence is like almost like an external thing, whereas the efficacy is more like internal and I'm not qualified or I could never do this. Is that Self-confidence right? is still about, self-confidence is how you feel about yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, is there is there negative or is it positive? Mm-hmm. Um, is there a negative positive affect about how you view you? Right. Whereas self efficacy is how do you view your level of capacity or task related mm. ability or skill? Got it. And so just getting into like an actual baseline definition for imposter syndrome with all that in mind, how would you define imposter syndrome? Yeah, it's the feeling that because you don't belong Mm. in different contexts you feel that you're going to be found out and Mm. thus you are a fraud right and I know I've experienced that Mm. so much in my life I feel like so many people have to some level and I feel like it is a spectrum in a sense um especially I feel like anything creative um I'm an actor and so there's like there's no definition of like what acting is and so it's interesting my acting coach who works with some of Hollywood's A-list celebrities are like have imposter syndrome and they're afraid that they're gonna be found out because they thought they just got like lucky along the way and there's no like defined definition of like what good acting is necessarily and I feel like that translates to so many areas um how has imposter syndrome showed up in your life such a great question because I think that I've internalized messages Mm. in the context of my own familial background okay is I am a immigrant I I was born and raised in Mexico okay and I think because I'm a woman and it is highly a patriarchal society Mm -hmm. um where looks matters money (laughs) matters right it's it's almost um really important there and my sister and I, I have a, I have a younger sister who is absolutely beautiful. She is a little bit darker skin than I am and has mm. darker eyes. Okay. And I pass, I'm white looking and, and have, um, green eyes and, mm. and, you know, I color my hair even blonder <laughs> than it already is. Um, but when I was younger, I would be told you're the pretty one. Mm. So you need to basically sit down and shut up so that somebody Mm. is not going to feel like you're defiant against them. Wow. And so I grew up with a person that used to say, you know, when you really want, you have moments of brilliance Mm. as if that was shocking or super surprising. Wow. And so when I started having intellectual curiosities of my own, Mm. where I wasn't just going to go to school, graduate, get married, do whatever. Yeah. Um, I started to feel like maybe that what, that I was being defiant against something greater than myself because I was supposed to be quiet, get Mm. married and then be a really good wife Mm. to someone who was smart, who was deterred and who was, um, and who was rich. Right. Right. And my sister inversely, or she internalized because I was told all the time that I was the beautiful one because Mm. I was a little bit whiter and all these other things. Mm. She internalized, well, you're not so pretty, so you should really be the one making money. Mm. So you should be a lawyer or an accountant or something that makes money because you're going to have to take care of yourself. Wow. And I think as I got older, that feeling never left me. Mm. And then there's all these other intersections because on top of it, I'm a woman and Mm -hmm. in the you know, I, I work in education. Yeah. And so a lot of people think, oh, education, it's full of women. Right. Well, right. But what about the top? Right. Because there's exclusive environments that have traditionally been boys clubs. Mm. And those are places at the top. Right, so even right. the people making um, decisions about what we're going to do next are all men. Mm-hmm. And whether they're men of color or not, they're still men. Mm. And so for me, it was you're a counselor. Mm -hmm. You don't belong in these other spaces where administrators live. Mm. Um, As I was, and I I remember vividly, um, I was sitting in my doctorate program Mm. and we were learning about learning and the context of how much capacity does your brain have? Mm. And 
I was sitting in a classroom learning about this idea of cognitive overload. Mm -hmm. And I did not know previous to that, that there is a capacity to how much knowledge you can learn at once. Wow. Your brain doesn't have capacity, but the amount of information that goes into your brain at once does. Wow, that's insane. And so when I was learning that about how if there is extraneous load, Mm -hmm. there's things that are distracting you from being able to fully pay that capacity of attention to something, then you don't transfer any of what is being um, communicated to you into your long-term memory. Wow. Is that what we see with ADHD? I know this is like a bit of a tangent, but is that kind Um, of some... I guess... The answer is yes and no. Mm -hmm. Just a person with ADD or ADHD Mm -hmm. would be a person who does not have the capacity to control their attention span. Got it. Okay. Um, Which means that you are distracted. And actually, that's that's a good point that you brought up at Mm -hmm. some point. I think a lot of people have been like, I have ADD. I can't. Yeah, exactly. That's the thing. It's like that all these things that we hear, we can internalize and make excuses for why we're not qualified. Right. But I think a lot of people confuse ADD and ADHD with Mm -hmm. problems in motivation and interest Mm. because we're told you should be good at this. Yeah. So you should have some interest in it Mm. when you don't. Okay. And so those, and I also think it, it, the way that we have, um, evolved into work environments Mm -hmm. sometimes don't work for you. Yeah. yeah. Right. If you're an outdoorsy person who can't sit in front of a computer for a very long time, then of course your interest is going to go down. Your motivation is going to go down. Your attention is going to go down. Right. And you're going to start procrastinating and doing all of these other things. Yeah. Um, and I do think that also the way that we are trained by media, Mm. um, to pay attention to, to the new shiny things that come on the screen. Yep. Just attention is an exercise that you need to yeah. do with your brain. Absolutely. That we are losing. Yeah. If we don't exercise things like meditation and, mm-hmm, and those mm-hmm. things, um, because then we become really bad at paying attention for long periods right. of time. Well, you know, it's crazy. My friend who's a screenwriter was telling me that now when they're writing scripts, they're using the data that I think it was something like, every it was really insanely short amount of time that people lose their interest and so because with streaming content there's so much out there that if you're not if you're not interested and you lost attention then you switch to the other thing so it's extremely important now as they're writing that there's something new happening every whatever seconds it says like every 20 seconds um which is crazy how that's like shifting our storytelling now which shifts our culture which and so I think being aware of that and then having the discipline like you said to meditate and and not fall victim to well I can't control my attention I can't because I feel like that all then does play into imposter syndrome actually that's that's interesting that you um brought that up because on the way here I was just having a conversation with a friend and um I was thinking about culture and organizational support that organizations provide the people that want to grow Mm. in terms of training, right? Mm -hmm. And how often people make mistakes in Mm. their roles Mm. um, and how often they're shamed Mm. for those mistakes. Wow. That even if you have task competency and you're really good at whatever it is that you do, if you were to make a mistake and you then feel shame for it, Mm. then, then you also conclude oh I'm not good at this for the one mistake you made when you've been 99% of the time have done it well and all of a sudden you're no longer good at it and you need to go do something else because because you don't belong there yeah and I'm when you brought that up um I was prepping for this a little bit and I was looking at the research of Valerie Young who has a book called The Secret Thoughts of Successful Women I don't know if you've heard of her but she kind of broke down different patterns of people that felt feelings of imposter. And Mm -hmm. one category that she um, talked about was perfectionists, which obviously I'm very interested (laughs) in this. The name of my podcast is imperfect because it's something that I'm really like, I I actually feel like perfectionism does interlink with imposter syndrome a lot. And so she said, perfectionists set extremely high expectations for themselves. And even if they meet 99% of their goals, they're going to feel like failures. Any small mistake will make them question their own competence. So I feel like that's exactly what you were just talking about. And that was actually something I wanted to ask you was, how have you seen like 
perf- how would you t- define perfectionism from the view of imposter syndrome? Yeah, it's probably just the fear-based notion that you can't make mistakes. Mm-hmm. Or that making mistakes draws a conclusion about how good or not good you are. Right, right. And I think that's dangerous. Absolutely. It's dangerous, and I think it's harmful for your mental well-being. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it it is comorbid, so it, it has, like, a relationship with anxiety. Yeah. I think that's why so many people suffer from anxiety. Right. Um, and why we've seen in mental health a huge um, increase in anxiety. Mm-hmm. When we talk about imposter syndrome... I think it's clear that people know, I think it's important people know, that there is a couple of different schools of thought when it comes to imposter syndrome. Mm. And imposter syndrome wasn't the original, I guess, title for what what happens when you have imposter feelings. Mm -hmm. Um, The original um, term was coined imposter phenomenon. Mm. Um, Because it is a phenomenon that happens in, within context, right? Okay. So you're saying, I want to be perfect at mm-hmm. whatever I'm doing. That's within a context. Right. And in some ways, we've allowed that context to tell us how we should feel about the mistakes we're making. Mm-hmm. Versus imposter syndrome really draws on the in, the problem within the individual. Okay. Like there's something wrong with you. Mm. Therefore, it's your syndrome mm. rather than you are actually existing in a space that is drawing within you mm. um, or t- is, is, yeah, is drawing within you some imposter feelings okay. because whatever it is that you're taking in are messages mm. that you cannot be imperfect. Yeah. Right? yeah. Think about it when you're, when you're a baby. Yeah. If a kid sm- spill, and I've thought about this cause I just had a baby. Yeah. And um, if a kid spills milk, mm-hmm. What do most parents do or most people, even if they're not parents around, they're like, oh my God, oh my God, no, like it's not okay, right? Like that's not okay. As opposed to being like, oh my gosh, it fell. Let's pick it up. No big deal. Wow. Right? So that's one very small way of internalizing. Mm. If I were to mess up, even accidentally, it's not okay. Wow. Yeah. And I think that's so important realizing like, we all have these narratives that we tell ourselves and then asking, I think becoming aware of those narratives and then asking why they exist and where they came from. So I feel like for me, like my dad is like very, very disciplined in type A. And so like, and I was raised kind of in that structure, but then I also personally, like I was diagnosed with OCD when I was younger. So my brain is kind of structured that way. So like with that brain structure, plus taking in what I was seeing and like these high expectations that were set for me, both externally and internally, it kind of reinforced that narrative that like in order to receive love or to make people happy, you have to perform always. Mm -hmm. And so I love hearing you talk about all this because it is just like, I think in one way or another, everyone struggles with some kind of feeling of inadequacy or not enough because we have received these narratives, whether it be through the media or through family or whatever it is over our lives. And so, um, I love that you're also being like brave and vulnerable to share like your feelings of that. I feel like I, when you were explaining about when you were, your experience, I feel like I cut you off a little bit because I got sidetracked about the ADHD, but so I know you said you were like sitting in this classroom, listening to people talk about educational capacity. And I'm an, I'm an immigrant. And Mm -hmm. so I had to learn English Mm -hmm. later in life. And I remember having a conversation with my siblings who are also immigrants and being like, I don't remember anything. I don't Mm. remember learning math. I don't remember learning science. I don't remember all these areas that I'm supposed to remember Mm. about where, when I first came here. Mm. And then I realized that it's because my brain was working so hard to learn or understand what was being said to me, that what was actually being said to me was too much for my brain to retain. Mm. And so I was driving home and I just started crying because I've, I made up my mind that I was actually dumber mm. than most people wow. and that I just would have to make up for it by working three times as hard. Wow. And so as I was like, oh my God, it wasn't me. Yeah. Um, I called my siblings and I also let them know that, that it's not our fault. Wow. 
and that we aren't dumber than other people and mm. that the capacity of my brain and the capacity of your brain is actually the same as long mm. as we are um, structurally sound. Right. And that it really is just about the practice that you take and the level of interest that you have in specific subjects that mm. then you develop that natural born um, fluidity to right. be able to extract information from your brain. Wow. I also learned that we, the way we cluster information Sometimes the way we cluster information makes it harder to retrieve. Mm. So lear learning is a science that is really important for people to understand, especially wow. the ones that are teaching us. Wow. But schools don't require that. Yeah. Schools don't require teachers to learn about this. Wow. And most teachers, I would say, do the very best they can with the tools they have. Mm. But with me, I feel that between the messages that I was receiving at home our societal structure, mm -hmm. cultural structure, mm -hmm. and then my own experiences, mm. trying to be intellectually curious and those yeah. kinds of things left me feeling sort of defeated mm. where I kind of was like, okay, I'm going to have to just work really hard to be mm. successful mm. because I'm just not smart enough. Wow. And so when I got into my doctorate program, Immediately, I told my husband, like, the first thing I said was, like, okay, well, I'm not going to be able to do anything because I'm going to try really hard because these people are going to be so smart and I'm not going to be able to keep up for them that I'm just wow. going to have to, like, really, like, try really, really hard mm -hmm. versus internalizing. And this is, I think, the, the key point of imposter syndrome that I think people need to know is that it is a phenomenon mm -hmm. and that it doesn't let you internalize your own success. Wow. If this podcast is amazing, <laughs> then you should be able to turn around and say, I did something amazing yeah. and feel really good about it. Yeah. And what imposter syndrome does is as, ooh, it's amazing, but is it because of you mm. or is it because of the people you had on here? Yeah. Did like, you just get lucky? Yeah. Right. right. Mm -hmm. Like, is it the topic mm -hmm. or is it you? Right. Right. That is so powerful. And I feel like even like I interviewed someone a few weeks ago who I listened to her podcast, like her podcast is amazing. She just came out with this book. So her saying yes to my podcast, I automatically went into, well, I must have tricked her somehow. Like then I'm going to interview her and she's going to find out that I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> and I was like really facing that imposter syndrome. And I think it's being aware of it and then kind of stopping it from letting it have the last word and so then you don't internalize those feelings yeah. um are you now that you're studying it is it something that you still struggle with um in your day-to-day -day? oh yeah I think I think there is something that is called critical theory mm. where I've learned that even some of the choices we make to go against the thoughts that are imprinted in us by the system mm -hmm. are actually still perpetuating our own doubt. Wow. And so we have to really critically think, is this decision that I'm making a result of me wanting to fight those feelings? Mm -hmm. Or is it coming from my own love and passion to create this? Wow. Right? Yeah. So I think sometimes that is how people can get started is like, mm -hmm. you know, I've felt this way, so I'm going to do this to combat it, which is mm -hmm. great. Mm -hmm. And I think what I'm trying to do is free myself from any other context than myself. Right. And to discover, okay, Mariana is all these different things, mm -hmm. but if I remove all those different labels, where do I emerge as a human being? Wow. And I think for me, it's advocacy. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing more that I want than to be a role model. Mm -hmm. And for me, that means that I have to take on the specific challenge that when I feel like I shouldn't come on this podcast, yeah. I only just graduated yeah. or I feel like I'm not doing things right. You yeah. know, I, I need to either ask for help. Mm -hmm. It's helped me ask for help. Mm -hmm. And when you're in an imposter syndrome moment yeah and you do something wrong and you have to ask for help that usually keeps you from asking for help 
because mm-hmm. then you're going to be say, oh, I made a mistake. You really got to know now. Right, right. And instead, I've challenged myself throughout my career and throughout this process to say, I don't know what I don't know. Mm-hmm. And instead of going ahead and making a mistake just to try, right, I'm going to actually just be authentic and say, hey, I don't know that. Right. And I'm willing and trying to grow. Mm-hmm. And it's really important to sort of check those messages Mm -hmm. if the people around you say I'm not going to teach you that well you're probably in the wrong context yeah but if they do end up saying oh my gosh that's amazing nine out of ten times people have been oh yeah let me help you wow yeah and I think there's something amazing about asking people for help it's like you never know if they're struggling with imposter syndrome or insecurity. And then by you asking them for help, I think it kind of validates them and makes them feel good about what they're doing. I think a lot of times people, I assume that asking people for help is a burden, but a lot of times it just allows people to like be reminded of their gifts and their like authority. And then also kind of step into what they love to do. And so I love that. And I think, Also, I loved what you were saying of like stripping away expectations and labels and really figuring out like who you are and what has emerged from that is advocacy. And you were talking about before about like motivation, interests and how that, um, I think there was a third thing there that you, yeah. And I just wanted to like expand upon that because I think it's really important. I don't want to like brush over it. I think there's something so important about we're told from a really young age that there are certain career paths that are really successful or like you said, you're a beautiful young girl, like you should go down this path. Um, And so before our brains have fully developed and we can make decisions for ourselves, we're kind of being put down these tracks. And like, so for me, it was like, um, my dad's an engineer, my brother's an engineer. I was always good at math and science, really. (laughs) But I was always good at math and science, but like I didn't love it. And I don't think I was able to work really hard to get A's in those classes and get in all the AP classes. But I don't think my brain was like wired in a way that like I was put on this earth to do math and science. (laughs) So, but I was told that's what I should do. So I had to work 10 times harder than everyone else in my class to keep up with their grades. And I think, again, that that put me in an imposter syndrome. Like, oh, I'm the girl in my AP classes that also likes to act and go to like and I play sport, like all these things that um, I felt like I didn't belong there and that I had to work really hard for people not to find out that I was like the stupid girl. And so um, but I think if I would have discovered earlier on that it's okay to pursue an unsafe career quote unquote unsafe career that is artistic and creative because that's actually where my motivation and my interests lie I may have avoided that feeling of imposter syndrome earlier on so yeah I just would love if you could talk a little bit more about the motivation and interest I just wanted to touch on that because I think it's important and I think a lot of people experience that yeah this is like my career counselor hat on yeah (laughs) where like it is very important for I'm gonna say just younger generations who are about to either go to college or just graduating from college it doesn't matter what you've done in your past Mm. what matters is right now Mm. and if you were to ask yourself the question of what makes you feel so curious that you forget it's an academic responsibility Mm. or it's a you know, you, you think of those times, I'm sure if you were in a theater class, that mm-hmm. would just time go by flying. Right, right. You weren't thinking about anything else. Mm-hmm. That's the kind of curiosity you want to follow. Mm. And if you aren't curious about anything, it's because you haven't had many diverse experiences. Mm. And so I definitely think that in order to avoid this sort of like pit in your stomach of, is am I doing the right thing? Is this it for me? Is this yeah. how happy I can be right. um, doing what I'm doing? Right. I think what the better question is, do you forget about everything else when you're doing it? Wow. And if the answer is yes, then you should continue to explore that. Wow. If the answer is no, then pick up a new a new path Mm -hmm. um, full of possibilities. Mm. If you have just graduated school, 
this right now it's the time like yeah. there is so many new there are so many new things happening yeah um with technology um and there are so many new things that are coming forward mm. about maybe careers we don't know we don't know about mm. but just to answer your question in order to avoid that imposter feeling i really think it's important to do a self check-in mm about well there is something that sparked this conversation in your head yeah right and so is the conversation in your head because people are questioning mm -hmm. the route you're taking mm. hey there isn't money there yeah hey what are you doing you're so good at this other thing yeah right and so i think sometimes we need to do a self audit of mm. what are the messages and conversations we're having with people mm -hmm. and what do we really want yeah and sometimes you will be i'm a people pleaser me too <laughs> <laughs> and that's what comes with imposter syndrome right. and perfectionism right, right, you just right, want right. to deliver perform and, right. and, and yeah. make sure people are happy but i think i've learned as i've gotten older that you just end up looping back around mm. into eventually coming to a place where you're gonna say that doesn't make me happy right i've tried it i've done it yeah it doesn't make me happy mm -hmm. and so I think the best advice that I can give is you already know internally what makes you tick, mm -hmm. right? You spend probably hours on Instagram looking up the things you do love, right? You probably spend hours thinking about the things out there that make you happy, yeah, right? Or, or the other possibility is that you really do feel like you're an imposter in whatever role you're, you're playing mm. and those feelings are also not real either yeah but when people feel like they are it's mm -hmm. really difficult to to shift right right and how have you I know you a big part of what led you to be where you are now is your experience with counseling mm -hmm. and I know that you've noticed some different trends like have you noticed that imposter syndrome and feelings of imposter syndrome affect certain demographics more than others yeah so I would say that my experience is very limited in mm -hmm. the sense that um, word of mouth and my own experience it's like my own lived experience yeah. of what I'm dealing with and the populations that I'm working with. Mm -hmm. But I did look this up before mm -hmm. I got here. Okay. Of what do we know and what are the gaps? Okay. And um, I looked at a literary review. Okay. Of all of the research that has been done and it is credible of wow. an, on imposter syndrome. Wow. And I can send it to you so that okay. if anyone wants to read it, they can. And I can link it in the episode notes too. Okay, awesome. And... I can say that out of all of the articles that are, have been compared mm -hmm. that have um, researched gender effects, okay, it is really important for people to know that we know that it affects women in different contexts more than men. Okay. Okay. But we also know that there is no difference between the rates of how people experience imposter syndrome or feelings of imposter between women and men okay does that make sense so I think what I'm hearing is that men and women can experience imposter syndrome just as easily or both just as likely okay but then within certain contexts women, women are more likely to feel feelings than men are right in that okay that's right interesting and according to some studies that the results when they were compared is that age as it relates to age mm. a higher age is negatively correlated with uh with with feelings of being an imposter okay so that means that the older you are the yeah. less likely you are to feel imposter syndrome okay um feelings which is was not surprising to me but very interesting yeah it is interesting I feel like when you get older in your career you know and it, like that makes sense to me but and I know we spoke about this as well and I want to get to this eventually of um kind of what we've noticed among our friends that are in their late 20s approaching 30 right, right, we've right. noticed a trend but was there any other data yeah so, you the, to share? so the other one was um that imposter feelings of imposter um are correlated with depression mm. anxiety 
low self-esteem, somatic symptoms, so symptoms that we think we have, Mm. uh, social dysfunctions. Mm. Um, And I think that can say a lot. Yeah. Because the treatment of each of these four when they were looked at, um, there isn't many treatments Mm. other than cognitive behavior therapy and just really changing the narratives that you're thinking of um, as it relates to whatever feelings of imposter that you're feeling, which I think that's where my project comes in. Yeah. Um, The project that I want to work on is to interview as many people as I can about their feelings of imposter, but feelings of people who are doing it anyway. Wow, yeah. So that we can find some commonality or some mm-hmm. ground, hopefully that arises Yeah, from all these interviews that says, I felt this, but I did this and it helped me. Mm-hmm. It's like finding a solution. Because I know when we were talking, you were saying there's obviously so much literature and research done on imposter syndrome. So we really know what it is, but right. there's not much around how to fix it. So I love that you're taking that approach because it is like, if we're talking about, I feel like it's come up so much in conversations with my friends recently and I hear about it a lot. And I was going to ask you, do you think that imposter phenomena or syndrome or whatever it's called um, is more prevalent today than ever? I don't know. I mean, I'm not asking you for like a a scientific answer, but just in your personal opinion. Uh, I think post-pandemic, I have seen a lot of people calling in to SMC Mm. and saying, I thought I wanted to be, I think because a lot of people have had moments to reflect on what they're doing. Wow. I think that people are finding themselves in a place where they no longer are tolerant of Mm. this feeling Mm. and they're starting to ask questions. Yeah. Why do I feel this way? Right. Or, hey, you feel this way since people are being more vocal and it's being talked about more. Yeah. I think people are realizing, oh my gosh, I'm not the only person that feels this way. Wow. Yeah. And I think, so I do think that, so let me answer this in in Mm -hmm. a couple of ways. The first one is yes. Mm -hmm. I think more people experience it today because I think that there is more knowledge and media around Mm -hmm. what you're supposed to look like, Mm. what the work you're supposed to do looks like as well, Mm -hmm. and the caliber of task-oriented competence that you're supposed to have, right? Right. And so in that sense, where a lot of people talk about their success and those Mm -hmm. kinds of things, I I do think that a lot of people are feeling imposter syndrome, especially around um, feelings of everyone has their passion and I don't, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, and, so, and like the highlight reels that we show on social media. Right, yeah. right, right, right. And so so there's that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think, I don't think social media makes it better with like the height of, of influencers and people mm-hmm. who want to do that for a living. Right. Um, you know, I think a lot of influencers have like their own special genius mm-hmm. and I think that's amazing. But I do think that that, a lot of younger folks look at look at those influencers and say, how do I become that? And if yeah. they can't, then I do think that there's a little disillusionment that affects their well-being. Yeah, absolutely. And I also think that there are so many mixed messages now that I think we are in a different era. Mm-hmm. And because of the social movements and cultural conversations that we've had with Black Lives Matter and all these other things, mm-hmm. I think that there is a recognition of where people are at Mm. and so I think most of my friends who I just turned 30 Mm. and so I think most of my friends who are 30 aren't married don't have kids or even if they are married and don't have kids um are feeling like they are going to be left behind Mm. in some way yeah if they don't have those things or even if they don't want those things right right and I think that there's a real problem with that absolutely because there is no timeline for when you should Mm -hmm. do x y and z Mm -hmm. and that cookie cutter sort of idea of what your life should look like you should be Mm -hmm. married you should be doing this you should Mm -hmm. be you should have a partner Mm -hmm. I think can be really toxic yeah and can lead to feelings of imposter as well right because it's like oh well you you haven't achieved this thing you don't belong you don't you're you're doing something wrong or again it gets into that internal narrative so I think that's and it makes sense it's like in ways we've become more connected than ever. And I think there is, like you said, a lot more transparency happening and people being 
vulnerable about what they're experiencing and feeling, which is amazing. I feel like that's kind of the first step to even having these dialogues for people to understand what imposter syndrome is so that they can go on that journey of deconstructing what they've internalized and believed. But then on the other hand, we have this um, culture of like, you need to do all of this and social media and everyone. It's interesting what you said about like young kids aspiring to be influencers now uh, because my YouTubers or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Because it's like my cousin, she's a school teacher of like, fourth graders or something and for and every year they ask like what do like a what do you want to be when you get older and for the first time in years a few years ago she started having people say influencers which like it's you know I'm not saying that's inherently bad but I think that people are seeing the glamour of that lifestyle on and young kids are impressionable seeing that on social media and like you said there's like a very unique skill set that goes into that and so if these kids don't have the resources or the skills to even achieve that, then they think that something's wrong. And again, with like social media and influencer, it's so much about external validation and likes and engagement. And if you're not experiencing that, again, it leads to, I don't belong or I'm doing something wrong or people don't value what I have to say or the content that I'm putting out there. Um, So I, all of that really makes sense. And I think, I also think the people who you see on Instagram who are great influencers yeah. are authentic. Mm-hmm. And I think what works for them is that even if they were not quote unquote influencers on Instagram, you would probably still see them like somewhere, yeah. like telling their friends about products or things because right. that's innate to them. Yeah. And that makes total sense for them. Right. Right. But do you want to be an influencer because you want to belong Mm -hmm. because you want to feel special? Yeah. Because you think that that is the way that you're going to be happy Mm. or do you want to be an influencer because you have something to say? Exactly. Yeah. I think no matter what we do, there's always like, we have to ask ourselves what our true intentions are. Um, And yeah, I know I touched upon this before, but getting into what we've noticed about our age group of like late twenties, what do you think, imposter syndrome looks like for people at that age and why do you think it's kind of prevalent I think that most people that experience imposter syndrome are doing it in silence Mm. so I, I do think that there's a couple of us that are like what's happening you know and I think most people especially men are just silent about it yeah I think a lot of them are just going through their day to day, figuring out how they're going to do better Mm. and telling themselves tomorrow, right? I'm going to be different. I'm going to do, I'm going to do something. Yeah. I'm going to go and I'm going to do X, Y, and Z set of behaviors that are different. Yeah. Right. And that's why books about habits and those kinds of things are so popular right now Yeah. because how do I change my habit? How do I wake up tomorrow? And I'm just someone totally different. Mm -hmm. But the first step is saying, Hey, there's something wrong here because I'm feeling like I'm not good enough in all these areas. Mm -hmm. And, and there's, there's gotta be a reason why. Right. Right. And so I think the way that it's manifesting in, in young, in, I guess in our demographic 20s, 30s Mm -hmm. is I think that people are suffering in silence and confiding with people sometimes in silence as well. Wow. Yeah. I think sometimes people will listen to this podcast and be like, Oh, that's totally me. Yeah. And, and not say it. Wow. Yeah. And I think too, when we were talking, you said something that I think is really true that as you're getting close to 30, like for some reason that feels like the arbitrary like marker where you either your life's not looking. Yeah. Like your life's not looking like you thought it would because you either had unrealistic or unmet expectations. And again, it comes back to having to perform and show something to people. Yeah. As opposed to reaching this like internal validation of I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be. Mm -hmm. What's meant for me won't miss me. Absolutely. And I'm navigating the world the best I can. Mm -hmm. And realizing that every experience you have, even if it isn't exactly where you thought it would bring you, that actually those experiences are preparing you for where you're at ultimately meant to be. My friend gave an analogy the other day of like, a lot of times we think that life will look like an explanation point where we go down this straight path and then we end up on the dot. And a lot of times it looks more like a question mark of like, Oh, I got to go down this way. Now we're curving this way. Like 2020 didn't know there was going to be a pandemic. And then you do, you still end up at the same dot of like, 
where you're meant to be and but sometimes it just might look a little different I also think that the way that this is going to be addressed Mm -hmm. is also within the culture of organizations and seeing those change Mm. because I think that a lot of times within organizations we have a culture of if you made a mistake shh don't tell anyone yeah versus especially with like the height of tech and building new things, Mm -hmm. you need innovation. Right. And that's part of making lots and lots of mistakes. Absolutely. But I, what I do think is important is sometimes we listen to people or podcasts from people who are already in their Mm fifties, settled in Mm -hmm. the risks they took were a long time ago. Yeah. And even though that's an amazing story, it feels far away mm-hmm. from the people who are doing it now. Mm-hmm. That's so important. And so I think things like your podcast, some of the adventures that I'm going to go on yeah. are our are, are way of modeling yeah. to the people around us yeah. that it's okay to be you. Mm-hmm. It's okay to take some risks. Mm-hmm. And we're sort of in a community where we can all do this together. I love that. So... I'm sure you're open to people like calling you and asking you questions and Mm -hmm. so am I, but Mm -hmm. how many people actually do that? Right, right. right? Yeah. And so I think one of the goals of not only this podcast, but, but my own is how do I get the people in those spaces who are suffering in silence, who are saying Mm -hmm. I'm an imposter today and I don't want to say it out loud because Mm -hmm. I don't want to deal with it. I love that. I usually tell some of my friends who I think, I've become a counselor, like in other areas as well. Yeah. Um, that there's always three types of clients. Yeah. There is the ones that just want to talk and talk and talk and talk about the problem. Mm -hmm. They don't want suggestions. They don't want to do anything about it. They just Mm. want to be heard. Mm. Then there is the, the client that comes in and wants to talk about it, but wants to discuss some solutions, but they're not ready to to take action. Okay. And then there is the there is the person that comes in and says, "This is what's wrong with me. I'm open to solutions." And then they actually put it into plan. Wow. Um, in motivation, putting something into plan or actually doing something is called active choice. Mm. And so my goal is, how can I relate to so many different types of stories out there? Yeah. That that person out there might consider the point of their active choice to be listening to a story that sounds and looks like them. Wow, that's incredible. And I'm like, I I, I love what you're doing. And the reason why I even reached out to you too in the first place was because like, I'm so passionate about that too. That's, I feel like a broken record when I talk about like the meaning of imperfect, but it is like kind of everything we've been talking about of everyone acting like they have it together makes us feel alone. Like we're the only ones experiencing these feelings of inadequacy. And the more that we can be vulnerable and embrace our imperfections, because I think a lot of times the things that we see as imperfections are, they can actually be a strength when you lean into it. Yeah. So like, even the fact that like, I've felt this way my whole life, I feel like, and I also have always been like really vulnerable and emotional my whole life. And that's something that I saw as like weakness. Right. But now it's like, why I'm a good actor and it's also allowed me to create a space for people to be vulnerable and share these conversations so that actually leads into one of the questions I want to ask for you I usually ask this last but I'm going to ask you now what is like an imperfection that maybe you saw as an imperfection that you're now embracing and it's it's the strength of yours oh I'm imperfect in many different ways (laughs) I think that I, in some ways, I'm adverse to change. Mm. Not so much in my physical surroundings, because I am ready. Yeah, yeah. Um, But I'm adverse to change sometimes if I've learned something. And over time, that thing that I felt like I really knew, new research comes up and it's Mm -hmm. actually not not Mm. it. I think it's difficult to wrap your head around something you think you knew that is now different. Right. Um, so now I think it's just like a pattern in my family. Yeah. And so now I've, I've seen how that manifests. So I'm trying my hardest to, to say, wow, I didn't know that. Mm. Tell me more about that versus mm-hmm. 
being like, no, I've read a hundred articles about that. That's not true. Or in an, in another way, something that I love about myself, but mm-hmm. I, I think is also very difficult. Mm-hmm. And I'll just be very candid. Yeah. It's very difficult to be my friend, I think. Mm. And I think it's difficult to be my friend because I exist in a space where if I love you, mm. I want you to exist in that same space. Mm. And I've had to let go of the control of helping people or what I think is helping people yeah. to get to where I think their potential lies. So yeah. try to get them to express it in some way. Right. That job, this relationship, wow. um, how do you, how are mm-hmm. you becoming the best person that you can be? Mm. How are you meditating? How are mm-hmm. you reflecting? Mm-hmm. What are your goals? Those kinds of things. Those are things I love about me. Yeah. Because I do think that, they, beautiful that they, things. they push people. Yeah. And I think that's one thing that I think my husband loves about me. Yeah. But I also think it's something that gets in the way sometimes Mm. of letting the people around me be who they are Mm. without feeling like they have to be different ways. Yeah. um, In order for me to to accept them or love them or or X, Y, and Z. And so I'm trying my best to understand that maybe when I was younger, and this is kind of a different topic, but in relationships or friendships, Mm -hmm. especially in Los Angeles (laughs) with girls, I think it's very easy to project your own expectations Mm. onto your friend. Mm. Yeah. And then I think after a long time, I think that person might be like, you know what? You're too much for me. I don't want to talk to you anymore. Mm. And so, although that doesn't happen to me too, too often because I'm kind of a fighter. If you say you want to leave my life, then I'll be like, now yeah (laughs) um but I do think that that I'm as I get older I think I'm growing to understand that you have your own life plan Mm -hmm. and if your life plan takes you 75 loops to get to a place where you understand why you exist Mm. then I should not be the person to shorten that yeah wow wow I think that's so amazing and like self-aware of you and I think it is like it is a strength of yours. Like that quality and that ability makes you an amazing friend and an amazing wife and an amazing counselor and everything that you're doing. And, but I think I've experienced a level of that too, of like, I just see the best in people and I want them to see the best in themselves, but realizing that not everyone's where you're at and you have to just like meet them where they're at. And sometimes that actually takes more love of like letting them be than in our way, in our mind, because I feel like I'm very similar to you, like our expression of love is like pushing people to be the best they can be. And sometimes you got to just like (laughs) let it be. Thank you for sharing that. I think we can all learn from that too, especially the part that you were saying about um, letting go of what we thought we knew or what we were expecting. Because I think when you look at things are so polarizing these days and people are not willing to have conversations about their beliefs if they have different beliefs a lot of the times. um, And then we hide behind social media, like making angry comments at each other. And I think the more we can just ask, why do you believe that? Um, It can just bring us to a more compassionate place. And I think we need that (laughs) more than ever. I absolutely, I agree. I think um, I've had more conversations about race Mm than I have ever before. Yeah. Um, and I don't know about you, but I, I watch The Bachelor. Uh-huh. Um, I wa- my I'm roommate watches fan. it, so I like I watch it here and there. Yeah. I was like, I was such a snob. I'm like, that's <laughs> not real TV and film. I'm not going to watch it. And I watched it one week with her, and I'm like, oh, this is actually really good. It's so good. <laughs> but I, um, I kind of realized that now race is making its way into conversations mm. where it didn't exist before. Mm. Right. Like, yeah, especially all these feel good sort of TV shows or, mm-hmm. or media mm-hmm. that's supposed to make us feel good and cuddly inside yeah. and like escape from the reality. And, right. Yeah. Right. You watch that sometimes because mm-hmm. sometimes we, let's be right. honest, we just we need, need a yeah. glass of wine and just <laughs> yeah. decompress. But I think, um, those are the spaces where we need those conversations most mm-hmm. because that's where, where our unconscious lives. Wow. Yeah. And so I think with what I was telling you of wanting to push people, I have a lot of white friends mm-hmm. who I need or I feel like I need to push. Like, yeah. let me push you yeah. onto a place because I don't believe in self-guided learning. Yeah. Um, I think that you need a roadmap for mm-hmm. learning. Mm-hmm. And with race specifically, if you don't understand it, it's probably because you haven't lived it. Right. And 
unless you want to understand someone's lived in experience, yeah, then you're not going to. Mm-hmm. And even people who I think are amazing and brilliant and I just love them to death. Yeah. Sometimes I think can be really comfortable mm-hmm. in understanding that they don't understand. Yeah. Without actually doing the work. Right. And so I've learned to allow people to get to spaces on their own. Yeah. And being a resource for them. Mm -hmm. It's the same people who suffer from imposter syndrome. Yeah. I've learned to help them understand and remind them. I've learned to be a reminder for people. Yeah. Like I'm no longer your pusher. Right, right. But I'm your reminder. Yeah. That, hey, you made a mistake at work. Mm -hmm. That means that, yeah. Maybe you were distracted. Maybe you haven't slept well. Mm -hmm. Maybe you overlooked it. Mm -hmm. All these other things could play a a variable of why that happened. Mm -hmm. But you're not the mistake. Yeah. You're good at what you do. Mm -hmm. And if you are going to be shamed or shaming yourself for making this mistake, this is where that road leads. Mm. So let me just remind you. Yeah. You're exactly where you're supposed to be. What's meant for you won't miss you. Yeah. And you need to own that mistake as part of your learning process. Right, right. That's such an important distinction too because I think we have to just give space for people to come to their conclusions on yeah. their own, whether it be educating themselves about Black Lives Matter or you know, embracing who they are and not being hard on themselves. It's like you kind of have to like live your life as an example and yeah. and show that you're always there for them but then let them come to that because it's like I think about when you're a kid and your parents are telling you don't do this don't do oh this it's like you kind of have to like mess up and, it, and realize why they tell you not to do certain things like the kid on the stove with the hand on the stove like <laughs> you have to experience it yourself because then you'll never put your hand on the stove again but then having like the resource and in that analogy of like your parents to be there to put a band-aid on and it's like okay now you'll listen to me it's like allowing that space for people instead of getting like so passionate that it pushes them away or even just even more powerfully even Mm -hmm. when Mm -hmm. you say good job yeah what are you saying good job to Mm -hmm. and what are you staying staying silent for wow so you're saying good job you did it when that person needs recognition Mm -hmm. but what about when that kid fails yeah right so I think for my son because I've been thinking about this a lot actually Mm. is sometimes it's not the things that you've been saying, don't do that, don't do this. We always have clear guidelines on what we should and shouldn't do. Yeah. But it's almost the spaces where it hurts more is when you tried really hard and mm. nobody saw that. Wow, yeah. Because then it just leads to more striving and working 10 times as hard so that I'll finally be recognized. Right, I, I've wow. been interviewing lately um, and I'm hoping this comes out after I've been hired. Yeah. Uh, but I've been interviewing lately and one of my imposter challenges yeah has been I exist within a space of education but Mm -hmm. I want to exist within a space of um just corporate environment Mm -hmm. because I think that's where I'm gonna grow next right I want to be a leader and I want to come back to the education eventually but Mm -hmm. one of my imposter syndrome sort of tells was that I just wouldn't do it well I would just be like no no I'm not qualified I I've never done that before um even though I have you know, in education, there's mm-hmm. like years of training for yeah. how to be scrappy, yeah. how to do a hundred different things, like while getting paid an X amount. Just right. an educator can do a lot. Right. Um, and I think part of me starting the project and also pushing myself is I'm going to push myself into this space because mm-hmm. it is so uncomfortable for me mm-hmm. and I feel so inadequate that I'm just going to try. Wow. And um, as a result, now I have like a pending offer. It's incredible. Um, And I would have never pushed myself out of that if I actually didn't have a supporting person in my life. So my Mm. husband was like my reminder of remember what you preach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't forget. Like, why wouldn't you? You have all these opinions about all the things we're doing. He's a consultant. Right. Then, you know, you should really put yourself out there. Wow. And so I think even if you love yourself and you have good self-efficacy and you have all these things Mm -hmm. it's also feeling like well I won't belong there because I don't have x y and z Mm. and realizing that you don't need x y and z right because maybe you're meant to be in that place to get x y and z right yeah exactly and yeah that kind of like leads to one of my last questions it's just that 
you are truly like walking the walk in everything you're talking about. And I know I mentioned in the intro that you launched this Instagram account, Dr. Ma. Yeah. And it's really about, well, I'll let you share what that's about. Yeah. So I came up with uh, Dr. Ma. Yeah. Dr. Because I think it's really important for my family heritage that yeah. I become a doctor. Yeah. Um, or that I have become one. And Doctora is doctor in Spanish. Mm -hmm. And Ma is Mama. Mm -hmm. And it's also Mariana, which mm -hmm. is my name. Mm -hmm. um, so that's easy to remember. But that project is really the space where I want all of my interviews to live. Mm. Because I think that people need roadmaps yeah. in order to get different places. We stand in the shoulders of, chi of giants as it mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we watch movies, all these things. Those are all stories. Yeah. What you do, yeah. you're building roadmaps for people. Right. Right, especially underprivileged, underserved communities that mm -hmm. don't see anything outside of their own community. Mm -hmm. And because of that, I want them to give them a roadmap to what it, what does it feel like to be an imposter and then make it to being a dentist? Right. What does it feel like to be an imposter growing up in a community where there is no background for you mm -hmm. and becoming the senior clinical director of a clinical psychologist's office? Mm -hmm. What does it look like to be an immigrant woman from Mexico who then ended up majoring in something totally different? I majored in political science, but my doctor isn't totally different mm -hmm. in something totally different, mm -hmm. right? What does it look like to be but people who are doing it now right right people who who remember what happened yesterday mm -hmm. and how hard it mm -hmm. was or even if you're or even someone that's made it really early on yeah. but didn't have the same challenges yeah my goal is to reach everyone wow and i think that we mirror each other's story in society that's why when we sit down maybe with a stranger and we're like oh my god me too <laughs> yeah, yeah um i think that we are a collective consciousness yeah and I think with that collective consciousness means that there is underlying themes about what's happening in our society today mm -hmm. that mirror what we want to hear. Yeah. And I think we are wanting to hear more authentic stories about people that go through the things that, that we all go through, mm -hmm. but who are unwilling to stay silent about it. Yeah. That's incredible. I'm so excited. I've yeah. even the few videos, I know you just launched it, but the few videos you've posted so far, I've Thanks. loved. So everybody needs to check it out. Yeah. We'll, we'll link that at the end. But my last question for you is, I know that your research that you're working towards is yeah. to come up with a solution of like, how do we yeah. fix this and how do we move forward? But if you could leave listeners with one thing now before you get to that conclusion, um, what would it be? Yeah, so actually this is why, so what I'm going to leave with, with is imposter phenomenon and feelings arise as a result of the context that we live in, whether mm -hmm. it's our, our own familial one that we grew up with mm -hmm. and then how that, that, those stories intersect with society as a whole mm -hmm. and culture as a whole. And so I brought on one of my very best friends. Her name is Fernando Beso. Mm -hmm. And she is the mental health person who is going to be listening to these stories from a mental health perspective. Okay. Um, and I think people need to know that imposter feelings lead to detrimental mental health problems. Mm, yeah. And challenges. Yeah. And so... I would like for those people who are feeling incredible amounts of anxiety, mm. but they can't figure out where it's coming from. Mm. Those kinds of things where if you don't know where it's coming from, you need to do a deeper dive. Wow. And hopefully imposter syndrome conversations that mirror and look like you mm -hmm. will make you wake up and say, oh my gosh, that's me. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And like know that you're not alone in it. Yeah. yeah. So I guess my last thing is imposter syndrome is about, is about mental health. Wow. That's amazing. I'm like, I can continue yeah. talking to you for so long yeah. about this, but I think that everyone just needs to like follow Dr. Rama because I know you'll go Thank so you. much deeper into all of this. So yeah. Could you just share with everyone how they can connect with you and follow yeah, you? Sure. So I am at Dr. Ma. It's Dr. underscore Ma. M -A. Okay. 
um, on Instagram for now. Mm -hmm. And we will be building out a platform for people to be able to watch the videos and those kinds of things. Eventually, it'll just be a podcast. Okay, amazing. We've gotten lots of requests for that. Yeah. And so we will be recording them as videos as well for those okay. that are visual people. Incredible. Um, but for the most part, it's just going to be my partner, Fernanda, and I, um, Fernie, for short, who are going to take a learning organizational sort of what happens at work when mm -hmm. we feel that way and then what happens in life when we feel that way amazing and so she's gonna take on the life and i'm yeah. gonna take on the work related situation i'm so exciting yeah. i'm excited I'm <laughs> yeah well thank you so much for joining You're us so today welcome. mariana and thank you everyone for tuning in like i said i will link all of those resources in the bio and we'll see you next week thank you <laughs>